Warning, this review contains spoilers for the Technomancer. I recommend you play the game before watching. I've always had a fascination with middle-of-the-road games, particularly RPGs. I don't know, I guess it's because I have an interest in this industry and I want to see the highs, the lows and the middles as it were. These games are most commonly referred to as shovelware, you know, the type of game that tries to mimic AAA trends only to fail due to budget constraints, but somewhere along the way they can have some surprisingly good moments or ideas. Of course that means dragging through the trashy part, so hey, I understand why some people reject them out of hand. They are an acquired taste. So moving on to today's topic, nobody puts the shovel into shovelware when it comes to action role playing games like Spiders. Spiders is a rather small size French developer who is almost exclusively published by Focus Home Interactive, the go to French publisher and is primarily famous for making sometimes interesting but very flawed games. Games which I want to talk about. The main focus will be on their newest project, the Technomancer, but before that I will do a retrospective of sorts. I should note I am primarily interested in talking about a role playing game Spiders has done since they also develop some adventure games that I won't include. Call me close minded and anti fun but something like Sherlock Holmes vs Jack the Ripper didn't make me go oh yeah. So let's start this whole thing off with Fairy Legends of Avalon which is a cute game in a baby's first RPG sort of way. It has this pretty entertaining gimmick where your character can fly around the different worlds you visit and they are actually interesting in terms of locations. You are tasked by Oberon the king of the fairy realm to investigate all sorts of strange disturbances, which takes you to places like the legendary Flying Dutchman ship or an Arabian styled city sitting on a giant scarab. I'm not gonna lie, I got way more mileage out of the flying part than I thought I would. RPGs rarely try to mess around with how your character moves from location to location and let's face it, that is what you do 80% of the time. In Fairy, you can go wee and zigzag all over the place, it is satisfying in a very primal sort of way. And you know what's a damn shame? That such a low scope game has more interesting places to visit than most games ever made, both by studios big and small. Now don't get me wrong, it's not an amazing title, combat is your typical abstract affair that you commonly see in RPGs like Dragon Quest or Final Fantasy, and it's relatively straightforward in terms of complexity. That being said, I do like how the progress system is tied to cosmetic changes to your character. When you advance, you can choose things like a cat's tail or dragonfly wings to sprout from your body. It's nice that most players will have very different looking avatars by the end. While it's by no means something that will rock your world, I genuinely would recommend this to someone like a 10 year old cousin. They will most likely have fun with this and hell, I would even recommend it to someone who is bored of your typical RPGs and wants to see some cool locations. It's only 8 hours long after all. In the end, I would categorize Fairy Legends of Avalon as a decent first effort for spiders and maybe a sign of good things to come. Next up is of Orcs and Men which was developed in conjunction with Cyanide, who is basically Spider's slightly more prestigious big brother. They are also French and also published mostly by Focus Home Interactive. I mention it because this game is basically built upon the bones of one of Cyanide's previous works, Game of Thrones the role playing game. Both are mostly linear action RPGs which give you control over two characters, whom you must use tactically to overcome challenges. In of Orcs and Men's case, it's the Berserker Orc Arkale and the Reluctant Goblin Rogue Styx. The game makes a strong point of enforcing their very different playstyles and personalities. Arkale is the more brute force warrior that can take on a large number of opponents, but he's at risk of getting enraged, which makes him go into a strong offensive frenzy that targets both friends and foes at the cost of any sort of defense, which can end very badly. Styx, on the other hand, is the more tactical, level headed assassin that can eliminate enemies before combat or disable them during it. The game represents how different these two are mechanically, not just from a story perspective, and that that's something to be appreciated in my opinion. And the story itself isn't half bad, it is written by Sylvain Sechy who also wrote the Game of Thrones RPG. Both titles make for more than decent fantasy adventures. You are on a mission to assassinate the Emperor of the Humans and along the way you have all sorts of misadventures and personal discoveries. The template of the story feels like what you would find in a modern buddy cop movie. Not complaining though, I liked it. Of Orcs and Men is not perfect by any means, it clearly lacks the depth to fill its scope in just 15 hours both in terms of gameplay and narrative. But I would be lying if I didn't admit to enjoying it a lot more than many highly rated AAA full price games. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and say that you should play the game. Yes, it is heavily flawed, but it ultimately provides a solid experience. 
Afterwards came Mars Warlocks, and it's here that things take a turn for the worse, sadly. The premise is basically the most interesting thing I can say about this game. It's post-apocalyptic Mars where society has devolved into a cyberpunk setting. I won't go into much more detail since the Technomancer takes place in the same universe, and I will expand when we get to talking about it. As for Mars Warlocks, it does a decent enough job of drawing you in at the start. You are a captured soldier in a prisoner camp and you want to escape. Fair enough and pretty straightforward as far as motivation goes. After the escape though, the game loses all focus and to be honest, this is something that plagues all of Spider's games and has gotten progressively worse. I have no idea why they are not capable of keeping a consistent pace, I mean in Mars case you roam around after the escape until you get involved into a revolution and then the game ends. They even manage to shove in a forced romance in the last 3 hours of the game, it's quite laughable. As for the gameplay, it isn't anything to write home about, but it did provide the base for Spider's next games. It's this generic mix of what you would expect from around that time. Clear influences from Arkham Asylum, Witcher 2 and Mass Effect. You roll around and smack people and it's terribly boring because there is no sense of positioning, and the enemy variety is lackluster to say the least. You do have elements like electrical attacks, traps, pistols and stealth to complement the melee combat, but I can't say they provided that much spice. It will still feel like you have played this game many times before. There is also crafting which makes sense while you're in prison, but after that it just feels token, like in most modern games that incorporate crafting, to be fair. And of course, because it is a modern role-playing game, there is a binary morality system where you can choose to kill people for extra currency or leave them be. It is as vapid and as unimaginative as you can probably guess, mainly because you are swimming in cash by the end, thus the choice loses all meaning. However, all of that pales in comparison to Mars Warlock's greatest sin, which is something that would hound all spider games after this point on, namely the respawning enemies and the backtracking. In the 15 or so hours it takes to beat this game, you will find the same enemies over over and over and over again, in the same places no less. It is such a painfully bad way to stretch out content and I bet that's what made most people quit, can't say I blame them. Overall, I guess I call this a gem in the rough, but that would be far too generous. While I did finish it, its mediocrity far overshadows its few interesting moments, which do exist to be fair. So. In the name of the resistance and right ideas of freedom for the people, I've committed sabotage, spied, even killed. Including one of their leaders who thought he was doing good and committed betrayal for the benefit of abundance. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. The game just needed more of them to be worth the hassle. Finally, we have a more quote-unquote prestigious title, a fully priced RPG that sold itself as a AAA game, namely Bound by Flame. It's probably safe to say that this is Spider's most competent game in the general sense of the word. They built and improved upon the systems they used in Mars Warlogs. The assets got a visible upgrade, the voice acting is passable, and the combat actually has some sort of fluidity to it. It still has the same flaws as in Mars, but it's somewhat more engaging. That being said, it is easily their worst game. Game, at least by my standards, because it is essentially Bioware light. The whole charm of these shovelware games is that they might try to at least be different in some way. Bound by the Flame simply offers no surprises or sense of wonder. It's Z-grade fantasy tripe. You have seen this story, these companions, these romances, the binary morality and this combat system many times before, and slight variations don't make up for what is an utterly generic experience. Not to mention that just like the others, this spiders game loses all focus past the halfway point and relies on backtracking and respawning enemies to pad out the length of the title. The last zone features an absurd amount of it through some truly tedious enemies. You can feel how tight the budget was towards the end. I actually remember starting to use stealth just to skip some of this trash. This game is not competent by AAA standards and not charming enough by shovelware standards. All in all, it commits the most terrible sin, at least in my opinion. It's boring. But let us see if spiders manage to turn it around with their latest game and the main focus of this video, the Technomancer. One of the reasons I did this retrospective before getting to the main review is that it was hard to convey my feelings for this game when I was starting out. Legends of Avalon and of Orcs and Men made me find spiders endearing, while Mars Warlogs and Bound by Flame mostly crushed that feeling. So being two for two, I was kind of at a crossroads here, not overly optimistic but not willing to hate it from the start. Spiders has always struggled to make themselves look as AAA as possible, but the results of these endeavors weren't exactly stellar. On the other hand, I did like the world Mars 
Mars Warlocks was set in, so I was willing to give it a shot, even though the gameplay looked a bit too close to Bound by Flame, at least for my taste. Now, with all that in mind, let's see exactly how the Technomancer fares under critical observation. To reiterate and expand upon what I said during the Mars Warlock segment, the red planet in this universe suffers from a massive catastrophe that left everything in shambles and separated contact to Earth. It's your usual post-apocalyptic story with technology from the colonists era being revered and referred to as artifacts. The survivors now living in shadowy ravines and metal domes to protect themselves from the sun's devastating rays. Which makes no sense by the way, Mars is further from the sun than Earth and since people can breathe outside, there must be some sort of atmosphere protecting the organisms on the planet, so this scorching sun thing makes no sense. But this is more science fantasy than science fiction, so let's go with the flow. The deadly radiation from the sun has a mutating effect which turned Earth-based organisms into alien monsters that gobble people up, people who also aren't spared from the mutating effect since they turn into creatures called… wait for it… Mutants, shocking, I know. These mutants and the normal humans live under the watchful eyes of the water corporations, which are basically the de facto nations of this planet. So much so that the name corporation here is more of a nod to cyberpunk settings than an actual proper term. They are full-blown nation-states by all logic rather than entities based on commerce, be it water or any other commodity. But again, let's go with the flow. The game is set in and around the Corporation of Abundance, a highly ordered and authoritarian place where people's surnames are based on their functions, such as Seeker for Scientist or Mancer for Technomancers. The architecture of this place borrows somewhat from the Imperial style of Star Wars, but I like it overall. I just wish the authoritarian aspect was shown a bit more though. The entire place has three maps which are the Exchange, Slums and Underworks. The Exchange is the main hub of the city, but the slums and the underworks look as disheveled as you might imagine. You spend more time in these dirty dysfunctional places than the orderly ones, so I can't say you get the feeling that this is a strong authoritarian state that controls people's lives. It feels a bit too much like a bit of a no man's land. And the writing doesn't help that much either, there is no talk of children getting forcefully put into roles they don't want, or the iron grip of the state choking the life out of its citizens. This place feels too free for what the game wants to portray it as. At one point you reach another city called Noctis, and exploring that zone didn't make me feel like I was talking to people from a different culture, despite the appearances. This is because Spider has a fundamental problem that is at its worst in the Technomancer. This studio likes ideas, but not details. The monsters that you encounter are a perfect example. While some are domesticated like these ostriches, most are just boss encounters for the protagonists of these games. It could have been robots, other bandits, or little pink fairies from another dimension. Hey! I'm just saying, it's kinda sad to treat the fauna of the ecosystem you have created as set pieces and nothing more. Now don't get me wrong, Spiders has put some decent effort into making the world of these games interesting. I consider it one of the few pluses they have in regards to other games. For example, I like the mutant-human relationship even though I wish it was expanded more since it has potential. It's your basic Eloy Morlock template that you have probably seen a dozen times before, but it is at least used for some moral dilemmas. Humans need mutants to survive since some repair to their cities can only be made from the outside and the mutants are resistant to the radiation, but at the same time they treat said mutants like animals, not too dissimilar to real life where many societies that practice slavery become unable to function without the slaves in question. Like I said, this could have been an interesting angle if expanded upon. As it stands, it just turns into a freedom fighters plot. The societal view of abundance is humans are good, mutants are bad, and the electric guys are weird. And the game doesn't evolve or play around with it enough. Speaking of electric guys that are weird, let's talk about the titular element of the game, namely the Technomancers. Essentially, they are the space wizards of the setting. They are human beings that can output massive amounts of electricity and with the right gear they can use said electricity to create shields, empower their weapons and of course electrocute their enemies. The more interesting part is their spiritual side since it seems that no matter by what corporations they are fostered, Technomancers are concerned with the discovery of colonist technology and a possible way to contact Earth again. Sadly, it's never explained why they act like this and it's more chalked up to well since they are the guys and the girls with the special abilities they're also spiritual Jedi <coughs> Jedi this is what happens when you wholesale take tropes without properly adapting them like I said ideas over details which is the prevailing feeling I got in regards to the Technomancer even though I consider its world building to be a plus sad but true before I go on I'd like to question why the hell did they remove their encyclopedia in the Technomancer you see Mars Warlocks had this nifty section where concept people 
people and creatures were explained. And honestly, almost everything I said in this part of the review comes from there rather than the Technomancer itself. Considering how much is not mentioned in dialogue, it's baffling to me that this element was omitted. In terms of development, it certainly cannot be that draining compared to the many other elements which make a game like this. I genuinely think it would have helped the experience both in terms of world building and narrative. Narrative which deserves its own examination, so let's move on and talk about the characters that inhabit this world and their story. The protagonist of the game is called Zachariah, whose facial features you can customize at the start. He was born in the slums of abundance and thus he had the surname of Rogue, which essentially meant he had no role, he was a street urchin. All that changed when he was discovered to have latent technomancer abilities and brought to be trained as one, thus being called Mancer at the end of his training. The story is divided in a pretty traditional fashion, you have a short prologue and epilogue with three chapters in between, each with its own city. The prologue covers the last part of Zachariah's initiation and the relationship with his master called Sean. The main focus of the initiation is going through some enemies that Zachariah later finds out are staged, to some monsters that are not so staged. You see, it takes place in and around the huge colonist dome that is the depository of all knowledge that the Abundance Technomancers have ever collected. Unfortunately, they, for some reason, let it get infested with these things and more importantly, this thing, that actually manages to wreck the entire dome. Yes, the Technomancers care so much about their library that they let it get infested and destroyed by monsters. What annoys me is how easy going the entire order is once they found out. I mean, think about it. The entire purpose of the Order of Abundance Technomancers is to contact Earth and store Earth-related knowledge, and they lost decades, maybe centuries worth of information. There's no way around it, it's just a huge plot hole. My greatest fear is that the reason it is so bad is that they made the area first, including the big dumb monster, and only then did they think of the story, it just reeks of lack of attention to detail. At any rate, the other important part of this prologue is that during the initiation, Zachariah finds out about a great secret that binds all Technomancers together, namely that they are the result of genetic experimentation by the original Earth colonists and by extension, mutants. I have so many issues with this. How could others not think they are mutants? Do people think Technomancer powers just come from a divine source? People would naturally be suspicious, not everybody can shoot lightning. Indeed, this could have been a great plot point, the entire brotherhood of Technomancers would cloak their order in mysticism and pseudoscience, to convince people that their powers come from a higher source instead of a mutation. It would explain their need for spirituality and maybe some of them would even start believing it. There could have been so many stories to tell. Instead, it's just a plot point thrown around and a motivation for why technomancers are distrusting of others due to believing they will end up like actual mutants, if people found out their secret. Never mind the fact that the mutants are primarily kept for their physical qualities, not because they are ugly or their genome is different. I repeat again, spiders likes ideas, but not details. After the initiation, the prologue ends and the story begins proper. Or should I say stories? You see, the Technomancer suffers from a very strange dual narrative identity crisis. There are two main story threads that run along each other. On the one hand, once you are a Technomancer, you are sent by your Grandmaster to investigate a strange ruin where you find an encrypted message that eventually puts you on track to finding a place capable of contacting Earth. On the other hand, you serve as a war asset, since your corporation is at war with another, and this leads you in conflict with a man named Colonel Victor that wants to conquer abundance from the inside. Both of these stories could have been their own games, instead they weave in and out of each other, barely interacting except at the end in the most token of ways. Why? Why couldn't the Technomancer have one well-defined story? As it stands, it just seems out of focus. But let's take a closer look. Chapter 1 has you doing tasks for the army since it's wartime. You see, the Technomancer shares a rather interesting relationship with Mars Warlocks due to the fact that it's more of a sidequel rather than a prequel or sequel. Both games are set against the backdrop of a war between two corporations, Aurora and Abundance. Mars shows things from Aurora's perspective, while the Technomancer details the Abundance side. At any rate, given that you are a living weapon essentially, you are employed by the army for various tasks such as finding deserters, protecting diplomats, or dealing with criminals, while you generally interact with the inhabitants of abundance and do quests for them. But keep in mind that no matter how hard you mess up in the eyes of the army, like letting the head of the underground resistance go and telling your officer about it, never will they kick you out since hey, the main storyline needs to go on. The choices here are mostly cosmetic I'm afraid. No matter what you do, Victor tries to recruit Zachariah into the ASC, which is essentially the CIA of abundance. He refuses and thus he is framed for several crimes 
he didn't do. This leads to fleeing the city with the companions you meet up to this point and being hunted down by abundance. But honestly, I'm sure everyone saw this plot twist coming a mile away. Almost every game where you work for an authoritarian organization, you end up fighting them at some point. Chapter 2 is basically the same as chapter 1, only in a different city, namely Noctis, the city of traders. You are given tasks that you must obey and roam around the city doing favors for people. There is a pretty lame sense that you're a glorified errand boy for most of the time. Very few quests like saving your technomancer brothers is something that feels like your character is doing of his own volition. Not to mention that the plot holes get bigger and bigger like the fact that Noctis is a prosperous trading city that is undiscovered for decades. Look how close it is to abundance on the map, it's impossible that at one point someone from the trader side didn't squeal about its location in so many years. Also, you can travel back to abundance, indeed, several quests demand it. Why are you even bothering to run away if you can just go back to the same places as before? Hell, you can even become the champion of the arena, that's how bad the plot holes are. But like I said, ideas over details, yada yada yada. Anyway, Zachariah finds the location of an outpost at one of the poles where it might be possible to contact Earth, but so does Victor who is continuously hunting for him. Dandolo, the leader of Noctis, decides that it's too dangerous, so you are sent to the Valley of Mutants, which is a thriving community of rebel mutants, and that's how chapter 3 starts. Zachariah arbitrarily decides that he finally wants to bring Victor down, one wonders why he just didn't do this from the start, and cut out the entirety of chapter 2. It's a pretty straightforward affair where the allies that you gather to bring Victor down validate your choices. A pleasure as always. If I'm gonna destabilize Colonel Victor, I'm gonna need some allies. Then you better keep looking, Mr. Manser. Unfortunately, the allies you've already made aren't folks I consider or want as my own. Goodbye. I know this will sound crazy, but I need your help. The armies. I think I've come up with a way to turn the assembly against Victor, but for it to work, I'm gonna need allies. That's not crazy, Zack. He's out of control. Something needs to be done. The army always remembers a good soldier's loyalty. You see, the Technomancer dedicates a large part of its efforts to making cosmetic choices, the vast majority of them don't matter. For example, you can spare one of the soldiers under your command that betrays you in chapter 1, only to find him in chapter 2 with only one short dialogue. It's meaningless. I'd say that what allies you pick for bringing down Victor is probably the only semi-relevant decision since the factions available to you are based on your reputation with them. Although now that I mention it, the reputation system is so bare bones it doesn't matter past this one point. You can play the game without even looking once at this screen and the experience would be the same. The faction ratings change so much arbitrarily due to how the story naturally progresses rather than your own actions and choices. There is barely any new content that opens up due to having good relationships with the factions. And on top of that you have the same binary morality system from Mars Warlocks that has the same issue of having all the money you want by the end. But it is what it is. Zachariah disgraces Victor which runs away to the ice facility and you go in hot pursuit. This is where the episode and game finale takes place. And before we proceed, allow me to nitpick the hell out of this location. Look at this map, this is supposed to be one of the poles, given the distance between Noctis and Abundance is less than a day, how is it possible for a frozen wasteland to exist so close? I don't care if it is Mars and science fantasy, weather patterns and geography are a thing. But anyway, after a few enemies comes the final confrontation with Victor, and he dies of a heart attack after the battle. It seems as if the weight of his hate was finally too much for him to bear. The villain is vanquished, his heart attack the final blow. Zechariah, you are free! Why? It feels like something out of a Saturday morning cartoon. If you have this morality system about killing and not killing, why not give the choice regarding Victor instead of making this lame heart attack excuse, so Zachariah doesn't have to dirty his hands? It makes no sense and it's frankly somewhat insulting to the player. But yeah, afterwards you go to the center of the facility and you try to contact Earth. Or do you? You see, before that, we need to have a big final boss fight sequence. This is so shallow. You have no warning and no idea this thing is here. I mean, even its size is an issue. How does it live here without knocking everything down to the ground? Spiders didn't put this big worm here because it had any relevance to the game. They put it here because this is the end and we need a boss fight for the end. It's creatively bankrupt to say the least, and poorly tested on top of that. I managed to bug it out twice. So after that absolutely shameful moment, Zachariah Mancer fulfills the Technomancer's goal of contacting Earth. Connection failed. Extrapolating a complete data. 
static solar system display. At least in spirit, because what he actually does is find out that Earth is no more. And to be honest, that is a pretty good twist to end the game on. It was obvious that something was going to happen and that you are not going to contact Earth. But I think it's an alright ending that brings a close to this story while allowing other stories later on. Afterwards you get to see a slideshow of your choices that is fairly limited to be honest, some of your companions and many major characters don't get mentioned. I saw some of the alternative possibilities on YouTube compared to my playthrough and trust me, there isn't much variety. If you saw the ending once, you saw it enough. Overall, I can't say that the Technomancer is the worst story I've ever seen in an RPG, but it certainly suffers from major problems, the main one being how disconnected it all is. It never builds up properly due to the conflict between the finding the Earth story and the dealing with the Victor story. And honestly, most of the time you just meander around being an electric errand boy. So that was the narrative, what about the writing? Well, if Euro Shovelware RPGs had a mark to distinguish themselves, it would be the wonky dialogue and this game is no different. There are more classical issues like the fact that your character has to ask about everything and everyone in a bland monotone voice, even though he was born and lived all his life in the city you are asking questions about. What can you tell me about the slums? Besides the underworks, they are the largest part of our city. As its population swelled, so did its buildings, but far too quickly and without proper standards which now leave its occupants sans adequate safety, urbanism or even means for sanitation. But this is far from the first game that does this. However, there are also weirdly chosen sentences that make absolutely no sense in the context of this world. In the first room where the game starts, you hear an engineer saying this. I fix it, they break it again. I fix it, they break it worse. I'm a modern fucking Sisyphus tasked with pissing in the ocean. What are the chances that this guy knows about Sisyphus in a post-apocalyptic setting? I'm not saying this is impossible, but it feels so out of place. The writers just didn't really seem to care about the nature of this world. For example, your Technomancer master says that you have the courage of lions. You showed the courage of lions beneath the dome, and for it you have been made an officer. Why would they not use something more logical from a cultural perspective like saying that Zachariah has the strength of a storm locust, which is this thing? Just so you understand what I'm saying, imagine if Obama gave a medal to a soldier and said, you have proved yourself worthy of Valhalla. I am sure most people would know what he was talking about, but it would still be culturally illogical. And this happens way too often, it's like the writers forgot that they were writing characters that live on cyberpunk Mars, and they probably have different points of reference. You see the tropes coming a mile away, like the rival that eventually betrays your order but you get your opportunity to redeem him, or the obviously talkative character with a distinctive design that certainly plays a role further on. Actually, I'd like to say your companions are one of the better parts of the game. You have Nisha and Amelia, which are your typical tough girl but soft inside acts that get real boring real fast, but the others are not so bad. Phobos is first introduced as Beg, this apparently mentally challenged mutant that is actually an undercover revolutionary that wants to help his people. It's a stereotype, but a well done stereotype. Although his story does highlight how your own character gets away with things because he is the protagonist. Phobos has to choose between being your companion or becoming the leader of his people in Mutant Valley. You on the other hand can become the grandmaster of the Technomancers but still continue your adventuring shenanigans without any new responsibilities. It's the kind of plot hole you only see in video games because rarely do functions come with the weight of their responsibility in this medium. Coming back to companions though, you have Scott, a mad scientist that picked you off the streets and brought you to the Technomancers. Later on you find out that you are part of his experiments to create more Technomancers, which succeeded and that is how you got your powers. But there is much more to him, especially regarding his son's death and the reasons for his research. It's a good story but it ends with a conversation where you can say get out or I understand and that's it. There's no punch to it as it were. I deeply regret that since he is a flawed, borderline evil, but very human character. Finally, we have Andrew, who was Zachariah's childhood friend, 
also a technomancer due to Scott's experiments. They grew up together, but Andrew had to leave the order due to an accident involving his unstable powers that cost him his arm and made an entire building collapse. This led to his exile and Zachariah's eventual discovery of him years on. Out of all the characters here, he has the biggest arc. Zachariah and Scott make him a new arm and he even gets initiated back into the order. That's why, even though I'm heterosexual, I thought he was the only potential love interest that made sense, so the writing must be worth something. The others, Nisha and Amelia, are pretty token and feel like they're there because RPG romances are a must apparently. Like I can see the main character having sex with Nisha or Amelia, but Andrew is the only one who has a believable true romance, because there's an actual journey there. That being said, the sex scenes are as lame as you can imagine and I just wish the developers would fade to black no matter what genders are involved. Taking everything into account, I can't really say that the writing and characterization blew me away, but it also didn't put me off, so let's say that that it could have been better, but it also could have been a lot worse. Ah, but now we come to the sticking point, how's the gameplay? Well, in essence, it's almost a carbon copy of Bound by Flame. The interface is almost the same for all intents and purposes. Your character has attributes, talents, equipment and skills, but how well they are used is debatable to say the least. Attributes are pretty straightforward and reminiscent of pen and paper systems like Dungeons and Dragons. You put points in the attribute that is tied to your weapons and armor and they play no role beyond restricting what you can equip. It's traditional and I can't say a lot more about it. I can, however, say that talents are a different matter entirely. The six talent branches you have are the non-combat interactions that your character has available to him. You have Charisma which boosts your companions, Science which opens up new healing options, and Crafting which allows higher tiers of improvements on your equipment, something that is almost mandatory. Really, improving your gear is pretty noticeable. Beyond that there is Stealth which is self-explanatory, Lockpicking which allows you to unlock containers while also boosting the damage of your traps, and finally Exploration which gives you a better chance at loot. I should also mention that Charisma, Science and Crafting also open up extra dialogue options, with Charisma being overly represented sadly. I think I I only saw 7 or so scientific plus crafting dialogue options combined throughout the entire game. My biggest pet peeve though with how these talents are implemented is that you can boost said talents by equipping items or having companions in your party. This leads to the terribly annoying habit of carrying a wardrobe of different clothes with you and swapping them around plus swapping the companions mid-adventure to get maximum efficiency. It's tedious and just plain bad design. Itemization is pretty standard in terms of stats. You have armor, extra damage, regeneration for your technomancer abilities and a bunch of resistances. The gear itself gives somewhat small bonuses but crafting and by extension improvements genuinely make a difference which is good but also bad since I said crafting is mandatory and that is why. The statistical increases are just too good. That being said, finding gear isn't really exciting since there isn't that much of it and you just equip the best stuff that you find. In accordance to your build, there are no special gear abilities or perks. This is probably because skills play a much more important role in what your character can do. They are the bread and butter of combat, so it's fitting to talk about these two at the same time. You have three weapon styles and technomancer abilities which correspond to four skill trees that you can invest in. The game doesn't really encourage weapon switch mid combat so you essentially choose a combat style plus technomancer abilities and focus on them. Honestly the combat styles aren't all that different though because of the way the content is approached isn't all that different. Warrior style uses a quarter staff and focuses on mobility with large sweeping attacks and a very long distance dodge. The rogue style uses a pistol and dagger with the focus being on quick bursts of damage. And the guardian style uses a mace and shield with the focus being on defense. The reason why the experience won't feel any different whatever your playstyle is, is because you are very susceptible to being ganged up on and having your attacks interrupted, so running around and kiting the enemies is the best way to deal with your opponents. The other reason is that no matter what weapon style you choose, there is no reason not to skill in technomancy, and technomancy can wholesale carry the game almost. I can't tell you how many encounters I won in a few seconds due to frying people with my Sith lightning. You basically channel your inner Palpatine and win. I understand that this is one of the draws of the game, being able to shoot lightning, but that doesn't mean that the progress isn't affected by this. Plus there is the fact that you have 3 active and 3 passive technomancy abilities and the 3 active ones all deal damage in some way. It's not very creative and can quickly become boring. 
However, that is not the main reason why combat is bad. No, it's the same reason it was in Mars Warlocks and Bound by Flame. Spiders is trying really hard to seem AAA and to that end they stretch their content as much as possible. The result being that you'll go over the same hub over and over again, fighting the same enemies over and over again. This was somewhat more tolerable in their previous games since those were shorter, but now it's gotten to the point where I can safely say that this is the single most damaging thing about the Technomancer. I mean just look at this pacing, this is the monster from the prologue, but it is also the last monster in the chapter 3 arena. This is some insane level of recycling. There is just no surprise from the content, idiotic boss fights aside. Consider that combat is about 75% of this game, that is a pretty big flaw, fatal in some people's view. If you have a 10 hour game and you pad it with 20 additional hours, you don't have a 30 hour game, you just have a 10 hour game with padding which is detrimental to the experience, if not crippling. Before I move on, I would like to talk about the difficulty of spider games. I finished all their RPGs on hard because I believe the flaws and strengths of a system are more apparent on higher difficulties than low ones, if such a choice exists. Spiders does have some absolutely frustrating moments where the difficulty jumps quite a few notches, sometimes due to poor Q&A and design like the end boss fight of Bound by Flame, which is a test in patience and frustration given its wonky hitboxes and stupidly high amount of health. But overall, their combat systems are not hard, rather the correct term is inflexible. What I mean by that is that if you do the wrong thing, the game punishes you hard, but if you do the right thing, it's a walk in the park. If you start mashing the attack button on an enemy, they will constantly dodge, unlike most action games where continuous defense is more of a special ability rather than a logical reaction. But if you kite around and use your entire inventory, like traps and technomancy abilities, then you never die. But my question is this, why does spiders make their games this way? The average gamer's skill is far below what they expect and yet they constantly go towards that market. Bound by Flame and the Technomancer got panned for being too hard by reviewers, in fact most of them. Again, it's three for three now on spiders as far as I'm concerned. It's so astonishingly boring and technically incompetent when it comes to developing any sort of fighting system. And when the majority of your game is going to be fighting things, you better damn well make it good. They haven't. I know some people will disagree about the concept of a well-designed easy game, but I think there is a fundamental lack of vision when it comes to the audience, that Spider so pines over and the way they try to, or rather fail to, make their games appealing to that audience. I truly think it will benefit their goals if they make their games easier. That pretty much sums up my thoughts about the combat. What about the rest? Well, the level design is competent enough, Spiders has been making all their games on the so-called Silk Engine, and I'm glad to see that they don't need so many artificial breaks anymore, like doors or fences to climb like in their previous games. That being said, after you have backtracked and crisscrossed around the few maps there are, you will be sick of seeing them. The padding is just too much like I said before, and no matter how good the level is, it will get stale. Not to mention that the devs decided to throw containers with mostly trash loot all over the place because this is an RPG and in RPGs people just leave chests in the street. To be honest, it reminds me of The Witcher 2 chapter hubs and I think the devs were certainly inspired by them. Just look at that animation. As far as quests go, they are pretty standard. Go here, talk to that guy, then kill this thing here. That is the norm. But there is the issue that multiple quests go to the same place in alternate fashion, so you will clear an area, then find out you have to go back again, which means clearing the same trash mobs, again. Still, there are some interesting bits such as when you have to race the sun to the city gates, which is the first time the day and night cycle is brought up. Yes, this game has a day and night cycle that has almost zero impact. I think there were only one or two quests where it was a factor. Shame it wasn't used more. The last thing I want to mention is how inconsistent the Technomancer is. For example, you get the option to skin animals at the start and then halfway through the game that option disappears, only to be replaced by directly draining the animal. It makes no difference really since most of the crafting items you find on animals you sell anyway, but it shows a lack of attention to detail. Or if you want an UI example, when in normal stance and you try to cast magnetic shield from your action menu, the character is just brought into the combat stance, you have to 
cast it again for it to apply. It might not seem like much, but these inconsistencies are the kind of thing that can turn people off from the game. Not to mention major design flaws like the flashlight. Why? Why does this item exist? Look at how bright everything is. Never will you have to use this item. Ever. Why is it in the game? Some could say that it does no harm, but I say it is reflective of a lack of attention to detail. And that, to be honest, is my pervasive feeling regarding how the gameplay was constructed. Now let's move on to production values. Visually, the game is competent enough. I've seen both better and worse textures. It's obviously not The Witcher 3, and at this price tag, it will probably disappoint a lot of people. I was overall fine with it, but then again, graphical fidelity doesn't rank that high up for me. Other aspects are sadly pretty laughable. The lip syncing goes from mediocre to absolutely horrendous. Pay attention to this dialogue. The actual words spoken and the lip movement. Oh, but if I can bother you, just a moment. I recently acquired a batch of materials that can improve your gear. It's not much, but I thought you'd like it. You can't still... still can't believe you're going to be an officer soon. Yeah, me too. Thanks, Scott means a lot. It looks like plastic dolls trying to mimic human speech. It's funny, but in their previous games, spiders had pretty subpar graphics, so the lip syncing didn't stand out as much. But here the faces look pretty realistic and thus the unnatural movements of their mouths hit that sweet uncanny valley spot. The music isn't anything to write home about. I can't say I remember all that much about it except the ASC theme, with its pretty heavy Soviet influences. It hits the mark as it were. The rest, standard video game music. Not much to say or complain about regarding the sound design also. Things can get a bit too hectic with many people fighting each other at once and sounds cutting in and out, but honestly it wasn't anything to get upset about. The biggest issue however with a Technomancer in terms of production value is its constant inability to support its tensor moments, most likely due to budget cuts. Too many important moments just get too short a payoff. For example, when you finally get enough evidence to bring Colonel Victor down, all you get is a a small cutscene of him getting chewed out and a fade to black. No mercy for traitors, treacherous scum! Toothpaste bastard! Cut out his tongue! Bumbling fool! Throw him in with the mutants! That was supposed to be the crowning moment where you ruined everything this man worked towards and getting revenge for ruining your life. It is such an unsatisfying end to something that the whole game worked towards and it is the kind of thing that AAA oriented gamers want and will remember. To finish up, it is a functional game overall, I only crashed once, but I wouldn't really put the Technomancer's production values as one of its highlights. <sighs> I'd rather see flawed, interestingly executed concepts rather than mediocre, competently executed ones. My main issue with the Technomancer is how tropes and concepts are used because that is how they are supposed to work, rather than understanding them and using them correctly. The pseudo-spirituality of the Technomancers, the sudden boss battles, the meaningless binary morality system, the neutered faction system, etc. It all feels very token, and honestly, that would describe the entire experience and game for me. I obviously don't expect spiders to woo me with their attempts at surviving alongside the bigger RPG studios, but I do want them to try and surprise me. I happily finished of Orcs and Men, words and all, because it was something a tad different from what I was usually expecting, but the path spiders has gone down makes it impossible to have this sort of feeling, especially in regards to Bound by Flame and more so the Technomancer. I can honestly say I have no more desire to buy any of their games like I did before, unless they change something, and what is sad is that this is the time to be different, rather than chase after the big boys. Games like Divinity Original Sin and its sequel who is shaping up to be quite spectacular prove that you can follow your creative output on a medium sized budget and thrive. Perhaps spiders will try in the future to be more oriented to doing their own thing instead of chasing after others. And even though they disappointed me greatly, I do hope they manage to find their own proper niche someday. As they say, hope dies last.